All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Data Programming One. As we get started, uh, go ahead, go to our webpage and um, download a bunch of files. Uh, under the code section, there is a Jupyter Notebook template that you can use to take notes on. Um, we're also going to be using that uh, pizza program there, <coughs> pizza.py. So go ahead and um, download that one. We're going to be working with that throughout the entire lecture. That's the main, main code for today. Um, and uh, go ahead and open that up in idle and get it ready to go. Uh, we'll also be using Python Tutor just a little bit, so you can go ahead and get that tool ready to go also. And just a quick reminder, uh, our exam is scheduled for next Wednesday, November 4th. Uh, there'll be an email coming soon with the exact timing that it'll be open and uh, all the other uh, questions you may have. All right, so the topic for today is error handling. Um, one of the things we're going to focus on is learning how to crash more. How many of you guys out there need help call writing code that crashes more often? Who wants their code to crash more? Um, there's some good reasons why we might want the, our code to actually crash. It's not the worst thing in the world. Uh, it's actually far worse to have code that produces a, a reasonable looking answer that's actually wrong. How many times have you guys run our test.py script to check your answers for your homework to find out that you know, the answer you got, it was producing a number, it looked good, but then when you ran the, the test.py, it found out that it was actually the wrong answer. Now, a lot of times code will contain semantic errors, which uh, produce the incorrect answer um, because of some other misunderstanding. It's not a runtime bug <clears throat> that's going to cause the code to crash. Suppose for a minute that after you uh, complete your university experience, you go and get a job as a programmer working for an engineering company that makes brackets and they're designing a brand new bracket to hold up the overhead compartments on airliners. And it's your job to do some simulations to decide exactly how thick the material needs to be so that it's strong enough that it doesn't break. Now, if your simulations come back with reasonable looking numbers and you pass them on um, and they start manufacturing brackets and then the overhead bins fall on people filled with luggage when they're flying, that'd be just terrible. And if your program produced something reasonable but it was a uh, an incorrect answer, something that looked like it's plausible but was actually wrong, it would be so much better if your code crashed instead of producing the incorrect result. So we're going to learn how to turn semantic bugs into runtime bugs which will crash using the assert statement. All right, we're also going to learn how to crash less. Sometimes there are perfectly reasonable things that we expect to happen that we want to just be able to deal with. You know, there are errors if uh, the user, for example, puts in some bad data. We want to be able to just tell them, hey, that's bad data, uh, try again. So we're going to learn about exceptions here. And we've been seeing exceptions every time our code crashed. Those crash messages, uh, the trace back with the, you know, the code crashed on line 9 with a key error called from some function on line 18 or something like that. Um, there are circumstances under which we expect code to crash. And what we want to be able to do is uh, deal with that and move on and not let it like completely ruin the program. We want to be able to carry on and move forward. All right, so I just want to go ahead and introduce this uh, pizza analyzer program and, and talk about it a little bit. Uh, first up, let me just go ahead and pull this up in idle and we'll run it and we'll start playing with it that way. Then we'll walk through the code and take a look at all the different pieces. All right, so I've already downloaded all those files from uh, the website today. Here we are. I'm going to go, whoops, shift right click to bring up PowerShell. We've got idle and this is the pizza.py. There we go. Now I'm just going to go ahead and run this. Run module F5. That's right. I knew that. So the first thing this is going to do is ask us for pizza diameter in inches and the slice count. So um, let me think. Diameter of a pizza. Um, oh. What I want to do is be able to put in some data, some numbers, so that I know that it's working. So if I put in like a 4-inch diameter pizza, um, I take that divided by 2 to get the radius. So the radius is 2. Pi r squared gives me 4 times pi, 4 pi. So if we cut that into 4 slices, so 4-inch diameter cut into 4 slices is going to give me... 3.14 basically pi square inches of pizza. So it looks like it's working. Um, it's basically, uh, it asks for the size of a pizza, how many slices we're going to cut it into, and tells me how many square inches of pizza we get. Let's try something a little more reasonable, maybe a small size pizza, uh, 10 inches in diameter. 
and cut it into six pieces. And we see that each slice of pizza has 13 square inches of pizza for our enjoyment. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna do Control C to quit that. Now let's go back to the slides. I believe they're still open right here. And just take a look at what's going on in the code. I like this one, it's color coded and I've got my questions over here. So first thing we're gonna do is we see that we're gonna be importing math because we use pi right there. Then we're defining two functions, uh, pizza size. Uh, this pizza size uh, takes the radius and computes the size of the pizza. Maybe a better name for this function would have been area of a circle, It'd be a little more general. Um, but it's doing the same thing. It's taking the radius, it's using the star star operator to square that, and multiplying it by pi. Then um, we have the next function here, the slice size. This takes the radius and the slice count. Uh, it then computes the total size by calling pizza size, so that gets the area of the circle. And then it's going to just return total size times 1 divided by slice count. All right, so that's just going to basically take the total size of the pizza, divide by how many slices we got, and return the number of square inches of pizza per slice. All right, then we have this main function that's going to do all the work, and at the very bottom we call main. This is a, a really common programming para, uh, structure where I want to put all my functions up at the beginning um, in, in some sort of arbitrary order, but Python needs to know where all the functions are before it runs any code. Okay, so here's the idea. Uh, in the function main, we have a loop. It's just going to go for i in range 10, so from 0 to 9, or it's going to run this loop 10 times. Uh, we're going to get some input from the user. So I see here in orange, I have this block, and then we're going to do some pizza analysis. So we've got two blocks here. Um, so the grab input is going to just use the input command. It's going to ask us, the, the user, enter pizza diameter in inches and the slice count. We just saw that in the demo. Then it's going to do some manipulation of that input to turn it into a form that the function can use easily. So as you remember, every time we use import, actually, quick quiz. When we use import, what's the type of that data that we get back? If I, you know, I typed in 4 comma 4, what is the type of that data? And if you said string, you are correct. Input always returns a string. So that means any whatever string it returns us, we've got to deal with it. So the next thing we're going to do is in this line right here by the mouse pointer. Yeah, I'll put it right here on that side. Um, args is equal. Yeah, this doesn't have line numbers. Ooh, I would really prefer line numbers. Maybe I will switch this. No, oh, the mouse pointer disappears. Uh, all right, hold on, hold on, hold on. Pointer options, arrow options, visible. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so the next thing we're going to do is um, take those arguments given to us by the user, and we're going to call split on them. Split is a string operator that's going to take a string and turn it into a list of items um, divided by the delimiter given in the parameter. So this is going to take a, basically a comma-separated list, uh, all as one string, and turn it into a list of strings. Next up, we're going to grab two values from that list. We're going to grab value 0, and value one. So this one, uh, the strip command is going to remove all of the extra spaces. So when I typed it in, I typed four comma space four. This will get rid of any extra spaces. Uh, it's going to go ahead then and turn the number that I entered into a floating point number. So if I'd done something like 4.2, it would actually record the 4.2. And then we'll divide that by two to go from a diameter to a radius. Okay, great. Uh, slices is going to be very similar. We're just getting the second argument from that list, the second number. Uh, we're going to remove any extra spaces around it and turn it into an integer. Then um, pizza analysis section is uh, calling the function slice size, giving it that radius in the slices, storing it in size, and then printing out a message, some important details about our pizza. So as you can see here, we're actually, we've got a string. Uh, the string is pizza radius, and then we're using this dot format. The format is another string function, so this is a great review for the exam. We've got like all kinds of string functions in here. That was from about five weeks ago, so if these are unfamiliar, as you guys are studying, this is a great one to go back and review. Right, so what format does is it's going to take the curly braces 
um, and replace those curly braces with variables from the parameter list uh, format. So it's going to actually take the number for the radius and replace those two brackets with it, or curly braces. It's going to take slices and replace those curly braces, and it's going to print out the size where those curly braces are. All right, so what I'd like you guys to do now, uh, if you've downloaded the Jupyter Notebook template and are taking some notes there, um, go ahead and, I mean, the question I want to answer is, what are things that we could put in as a user that would be bad inputs? The only things I've entered so far, I put in 4.4, 10, 6. Both of those work just fine. But there are possible inputs that I could type into this code that would do bad things. So I want you guys to just take a minute and brainstorm some of these, and then uh, jot them down in Jupyter Notebook, and think about, you know, why is it a bad input? What kind of error is it going to cause? Is this a runtime error? Will it crash? Or is it a semantic error that's just going to give us the wrong answer? Uh, go ahead and think about that stuff. And I'll be right back with my list in a moment. All right, so here's some things that I came up with. Uh, I just popped back over to the template and figured I'd enter these here. Um, so if slices are equal to zero, uh, at some point in this code, we divide by zero uh, slices. Yeah, right there, slice count. We're dividing by that. And if we put in a, a, a zero value and make it end up in that spot right there, we're going to divide by zero. We'll get a division by zero error. So that is going to be a runtime division by zero. Okay, some other things we could do. We could put in stuff that are not numbers. So we'll, we'll see. Um, Non-numerical data. This is going to give us um, a type error. It would be runtime type error. There we go. Uh, we could leave out the comma uh, because we do need two pieces of, of data. We need the diameter and the slice count. If we leave out the comma and just like type four four or something without a comma between them, that's going to give us another uh, runtime error. Let's see what's this one called. Um, I think it's a value error. We'll go ahead, we'll test some of these um, and just make sure I get the type right. Uh, let's see, what else could we do? We could type in a floating point number for slices. So we have the diameter, so we could put in four inches in diameter and we want to cut this into 2.5 slices. So float four slice count. Yeah, that's not gonna work either. That's I believe that's gonna be a type error also. All right, something else we could do. We could put in a negative number of slices. So what could be more sad than having negative slices of pizza? But um, that should actually run. It should produce an incorrect result. Uh, should make a lot of sense that, hey, as a normal human watching this, I, I should understand that I should not have negative pizza. So, But it's still a, an error. I can still put in negative input for slices. So this will run just fine, but it's going to be a semantic error because it's not going to crash. It's good. Math will be just fine, but produce a, have a result that doesn't make any sense. Um, let's see, what else could we do? We could put in a negative diameter. This one is insidious. Uh, it's probably the most evil of all of these right here because even though I'm giving it what's clearly bad input, we can't have the negative diameter for the pizza, um, because that value is squared, it's, uh, pi r squared, if you take a negative number times a, a itself, uh, another negative number, it's going to give you a positive number. So this is going to return something that looks like a very reasonable answer for the size of the, the pizza, even though we have given it bad input. So this is kind of scary. We would much rather have this kind of thing um, crash the code. All right, let me just go ahead and... Put that semantic error right there and now i'm going to jump back over to the slides okay so next up um python gives us a way to cause our code to crash more it's the assert statement it's actually very simple it's just the word assert all lowercase followed by any boolean expression we've been using boolean expressions since the beginning of the course every time we write a conditional like an if statement it's followed by a boolean expression Every time we write a while loop, there's a Boolean expression there that tells us when we need to exit. This is going to force the program to crash. So basically, we're going to if use our knowledge as programmers uh, and as humans 
to tell it it needs to crash from this garbage input. So it can turn a semantic bug, you know, things that are really hard to catch, like negative pizza, into a runtime error and make that much easier to debug. So here's how this works on the inside. If the Boolean expression in the assert statement is true, absolutely nothing happens. If the Boolean expression is false, then the code will crash. It's going to give us a, a giant error message, the traceback that we've seen from every other um, time our code crashes. And it tells us that this is an assertion error. Okay, uh, just a little heads up that this does cause your code to run a tiny bit more slowly, like imperceptibly slower, um, because it's got to evaluate this Boolean expression. Um, and it's possible to disable all assertions. A lot of times programmers will use these while they're in the process of developing code, but then when they put out their release mode for the public, they'll disable all of the assertions to improve performance. Um, and sometimes other people will disable the assertions. <laughs> and so you can't count on them being there when you give away your code because other people have the power to turn them off. All right, so before we go ahead and go and add assertions to the pizza uh, code, let's just take a look at uh, a little bit, uh, just a few examples, I guess. So some things like this, assert x is greater than zero. If x is actually greater than zero, then nothing happens. If it's true, nothing happens. The moment we find something is false, so if x is negative or zero, it's going to crash. Uh, assert items not equal to none. So this is just going to verify for us that items actually have some data that we can continue on with. Assert age in person. Uh, here I, we can assume that person is a dictionary, complete with a bunch of different uh, in pieces of information about the person. Age is one of those. We just want to make sure that they've actually entered an age. And here we go. Assert length of nums mod 2 is equal to 1. This is going to check to make sure that the length of our list uh, numbers is actually an odd number, 1, 3, 5, so that when we divide by 2, the remainder is actually 1. All right, so we're going to go ahead and go back to the pizza example, and we're going to add assertion statements so that it crashes if the diameter is less than 0 or the slice is less than or equal to 0. Let me pull that up real quick. All right, so I was looking at this, and I think probably the best place, it makes a lot of sense to put it right up here right before we use these things, in slice size. So let's go ahead and just add an assert that radius is greater than 0. And then we'll assert that slice count is greater than 0. All right, now let's go ahead and uh, we'll run this. So that's um, save f5 to run it. Now we're over here on the bottom, uh, enter pizza diameter. So let's just go with 4, 4 and make sure this still works. That looks good to me. All right, now let's try adding a negative radius. So minus 2. Can't actually see the code. Hold on, let's make this big. There we go. Minus 2 and 4. 5. Go with 5. And we can see that it instantly crashed the moment I did this. It, all right, so we can see from the traceback that function main was called at line 25. Here it is function main called at line 25. Inside of main we called slice size on line 21 and then on line 7 there was an error. It's this assert radius greater than 0 is an assertion error. All right let me go back and just demonstrate some of these other problems. So first thing I'm going to do I'm just going to put this back I'm going to comment out these two assertions, and then we'll just see what type of errors we get when we do some of these other, those experiments that we were thinking about at the beginning. So I'm going to save this. I'm going to run this code. Bring this up. All right, so some of the things we were thinking about trying. Uh, zero uh, slice count was one of them. So if we have a 10-inch pizza with zero slices, we're going to be dividing by zero. So that is a zero division error. Okay, I've got a giant list of all the exceptions. It's not actually that many um, at the end of the lecture, so I don't need to remember exactly what these are. We can just go to the list and, and think about them. All right, so I just restarted it. We could also put in something like a comma a, and that's going to give us a value error because we can't convert from a string to a float. And that's going to be happening in line right here as soon as we're trying to convert from a string to a float. All right, uh, if we... Go back over here, run this again. I'm messing up. Back here, run this again. 
let's see, what were some of the other things? Oh, we leave out the comma. So if we just do 4, 4, um, this again is going to, could not convert string to a float. So it's trying to take this string, the entire thing, and turn it into a float. Uh, it needs to be a, an individual float number in, inside the string in order for this to work. Um, let's do a slight variation on that. We'll just start this again. What if we did that? We just accidentally leave out the comma there. This error doesn't pop up until we try and access argument one. Um, this is a list index out of range, so an index error. Let me take a look at the code real quick for that one. So in this case, I've only put in one number. I didn't give it two numbers. And so that's fine. Input is going to read one number. Uh, it's going to return it as a string. Uh, split is that string function. It's going to work just fine. If there's one comma, we get two things back. If there's two commas, we get three things back. If there are no commas, it's fine. It's just going to return the one thing uh, as a list, a list with one item in it. Perfect. Uh, then this line works just fine too because it's going to take index zero, the one thing in that list. It's a string. It's going to strip off the spaces, turn into a float, divide by two, carry on. This is where we get to a problem. Because our list only has one thing in it, that's at index zero, we do not have anything in index one. So this is where we're getting our index error right there. All right, next up, let me go ahead and do one more. Uh, let's suppose our pizza is negative 10 inches in diameter. And we cut that into six pieces. This is going to tell us that we're getting um, 13.1 square inches of pizza. That's a perfectly reasonable sounding number for the amount of pizza, even though I put in bad data. So this is, this is the really deceptive one that we want to make sure we stop. All right, so I'm just going to come back. I'm going to put my assertion statements back in. And I'm going to test those uh, three of those examples again. So save this, run it down here at the bottom, enter the pizza. What if the diameter is negative? Do the big one first. And we cut that into six pieces. We want this to crash. We don't want it to give us a perfectly reasonable 13.08 value. And again, indeed it does. It crashes right there. The traceback tells me exactly where it's coming from. And the error we're getting is an assertion error because I put that in myself. All right, next up, let's run this one more time. Uh, let's do, well, that was the negative. Let's try the divide by zero one. So a four inch pizza uh, cut into zero pieces. Again, this is gonna crash also. Now it's not a division by zero error, it's an assertion error. And we can, uh, that's the one that we put in. Uh, we asserted that slice count was greater than zero, otherwise it's going to crash. So I was just thinking, this might not be the best way to deal with this particular error. And we're going to learn more about this than before the end of the lecture. But just having a generic assertion error, this doesn't tell us a whole lot about what's going on. And my guess is there's a lot of you out there who are thinking, why not just use an if statement? That gives me a whole lot more control. I can actually have it print out some sort of message to let the user go back and fix it. Uh, the answer is that this is just quick and dirty, easy way for us to, to stop things from running. Uh, we'll learn um, a little bit more you know, before the end of the lecture about how to upgrade this to give it more power to do that. And I was just thinking that in this case, you know that divide by zero message that we got when I left it was probably actually more useful than in a, just a generic assertion error because it doesn't actually give us any information about what's going wrong. So that's coming up before the end of the lecture. Uh, but first, I want to go on to that second question that I asked at the very beginning. What if we want to keep going even if there's an error? What if the user gives us some bad data? We want to be able to deal with it and tell them, hey, that was bad data. Why don't you try again? We can't divide by zero. Can't have zero slices. So Python gives us this try except uh, structure that lets us do exactly that. The syntax, uh, suppose I have a function here uh, called flaky function that's going to have some sort of problem in it, like a divide by zero. Um, we can use this structure, try, and then run the flaky function. If there's any error uh, that pops up, it's called an exception, and we can uh, catch that and do something, uh, any sort of error handling we want. And heads up, guys, anytime you guys do any error handling, any sort of accepting any clause like this, it needs to print something out. 
Uh, that's just good practice. Uh, if, if you catch an exception and don't print out anything, then it's like hiding the bugs. And that makes it even worse. You're like taking existing things that would have crashed and masking it so no one knows. Okay, so a couple of uh, just uh, like how this works. Uh, try and accept blocks. These are blocks. It doesn't just have to be one line. We can have an entire block. They come in pairs. So try is followed by some a block of code. And then if any of this stuff goes wrong, uh, the code in the accept block runs. Okay, so Python's going to try the code in the try block. If anything is uh, broken, if it throws an exception, um, if it crashes, that's all. That, those are all. Those all mean the same thing. Then it runs the accept block instead of crashing, and we catch the error and can deal with it. Uh, if there is not an exception, then this code in the accept block never runs. All right, I've got just a couple of uh, quick Python tutor demonstrations to like walk through and show you guys how this works, and just a couple of little details about this. So I'm going to go ahead and pull these up in Python tutor. The code is available in those p0, p1, p2 files in the code directory. So if you want to just copy and paste those into Python Tutor, you can grab them from right there if you downloaded all the files in that directory. Uh, one second while I pull those up myself. All right, so here's the first one. We have um, this try block, and it's just going to do some... Well, here, let's walk through it. Uh, red arrow is the next line to run. So it's going to 2 inverse is, and then 1 divided by 2 prints out 0 0.5. 1 inverse, so is 1 divided by 1. So we're just basically taking 1 divided by um, each of these. Uh, 1.0, 0 inverse is 1 divided by 0. That is not going to work. That's going to crash. It should be a... Did it do it yet? Yep, 0 division error. So now that it's crashed, um, it's created an exception. It's thrown an exception. Those are all that mean the same thing. Um, and that exception is going to be caught by the accept block right here. So it's going to, instead of just crashing, we've got this problem though, it's going to jump down to the accept block and run this code. And print out, that's all folks. I want to highlight, really, really important here, that it skipped all of the code after the error. Okay, that's the whole point of this example is it ran all the way until it found the error. All of this code, actually, this much actually executed. This one caused a problem. When it, when it crashed, it jumped down to the accept and did that. Never ran those two lines. All right, cool. Right, that's all I want to do here. Let me grab the next example. All right, this one is the buggy example. So up here in the line one, we're defining function buggy. It's going to print some stuff out, but this is the important line right here, line three. It's going to try and divide by zero, one divided by zero. So this is going to crash the, the program. Uh, we've also got another function here, g. Uh, this one is just a function that calls buggy and prints out some stuff before and after. And then we have a function f. This is the one with the try, except blocks. And the try block is going to call g and print out some stuff before and after. Um, yep, and then we're going to call f. So let's walk through this. First thing, uh, we're going to remember where buggy, g, and f are. And we call f. So we get a stack frame here for f. f is going to go straight into that try block. It's going to print out let's call g, and then it actually calls g. New stack frame for g. All right, then g is going to print something out and then call buggy. And then in buggy, we've got a brand new stack frame here. Uh, we're going to print out about to fail, and then we cannot divide by zero. Next, that's going to give us this zero division error. Uh, that's not good. So at this point, um, Python is going to look first in this function and say, uh, was I in a try block? Can anybody help me out? I've got an exception. Uh, zero division error. Help anybody. And buggy can't do it, of course. So it's going to exit buggy immediately and then go back up to G. So this line never prints. There was an error message. It goes up to G. And in fact, we can, uh, when I click next, I believe the stack frames in Python Tutor actually pop off. So uh, return value none. G. G can't deal with it either. There's no try except here. So there's nothing G can do about it. There's nothing in this stack frame that's going to help us out. So return value none. It's going to return instantly without ever printing out the after buggy. And then we were back up here and haha, 
hey, look, G was in a try except block. So now I've got this exception returned by G, and the moment that happens, we're going to jump down to the accept line and print out the that didn't go so well. There it is. And then that should be the end. Yep, there it is. Okay, so what I want to point out here is that um, Python is going to try and solve uh, the exception as close as it can to where it happened. So if it's in a function, it's going to look for a uh, try accept uh, block uh, around that code. If it doesn't find one, and then it goes to the function that called it. If it doesn't find one there, it's going to go to the function that called that until it does find one or it exits all the way out of the global frame without ever finding something. If that happens, then it actually crashes the code, crashes your program, and sends that traceback message to the console. Let me go ahead and just add in right here, try, and then accept. We'll just print out the word caught, and that will deal with it. And then we'll go ahead and run this again. So this is going to take care of it right here inside of Buggy, and it will never need to go back up and get to this point right here. All right, so let me go back to first. All right, so next, 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 next gets us the definitions of those functions. Then we'll call f. So then we'll print out, let's call g. We jump into g before buggy in g. We call buggy, and we're back up at the top here. Uh, buggy is about to fail. Trying to divide by zero. Uh, it shouldn't print, that should fail. But instead, we're going to jump down to this accept. It's going to print out that we caught the exception. And then it's just going to carry on. So it's going to actually print out this buggy oops. Okay. Then it's going to, uh, that's the end of the function, returns none. Uh, G is going to now continue by printing out G after buggy. And then we finish up with F reporting that G returned normally. So, uh, yeah, the point was that it's the closest. Uh, try accept block that deals with it. If it's not in the immediate function, then it just starts returning all the way back up until, you know, it, it finds some place that can deal with it or it crashes. All right, in the pizza code, there's really two main places where we might want to catch uh, problems and then carry on and let the user try again. Um, the first one is entering input. Uh, we found it was easily possible to put in bad input by like only putting in one number or by putting in some text, something that wasn't numbers. So here's what I want to do here to deal with that. We're going to put all of this getting input code in a try block. And we'll put in the math too that deals with it because that's where the problems are going to... This is where we really saw the problems arising. So we'll put an accept here. And we'll just um, print out a message for the user. Print bad input please try again all right quote and parenthesis there we go there we go and let's upgrade this a little bit it's really bad try again and we'll make that a sense okay that's looking good to me okay so what's going to happen here is we'll go through we get some input if it's bad it's going to print out this bad input this is this is in a loop right here so they're going to get another chance but it's going to try and run this code unless we do something to skip it uh, think hard how do i skip code and go to the next iteration of a loop quick review if you thought of the phrase continue you are absolutely right this is a really really classic structure try accept continue being the last line of your accept block. Uh, we see this all the time. This is a really common use uh, programming pattern. And again, every time I ever write accept, if I have an accept block, I put something that prints out some information for me uh, so that I know that I actually hit that and uh, it doesn't hide the mistakes. Okay, so this is the first one. Um, the other thing that can happen uh, is not just user input problems, but like math error problems. Uh, we tried to deal with those up here with the asserts, but um, let's go ahead and just, if we actually find that there's a problem, uh, the assertion is going to generate that assertion error, we want to catch that and deal with that also. 
So I'm going to go ahead and take the pizza analysis section. We'll put this into a try block. Print that out. And now in the accept block here, I need to print something. Print analysis error. Good, that should work. Um, and now this is the end of the function. Uh, so I don't actually need to do anything to jump back up to the next iteration of the loop. If I want to, I can put continue here, but it completely unnecessary. This is the end of the loop. All right, let's go ahead and save this and try running it. So first thing up, um, enter the pizza diameter. I'm just going to put in A, and A will give it A comma A, two characters. Uh, there we go. Bad input. Please try again. I think the last time we did this, we got a type error. Let's try 44. Uh, again, bad input. I only gave it one number. Um, let's see, what are some of the other things? Oh, let's try a uh, negative diameter, negative four, and cut that into six pieces. Analysis error. So instead of crashing, it's letting us try again. Um, what else we try? Um, I can't think of anything. I'm going to carry on. You guys at home, do some more experimenting. Uh, try some of the other bad things that you guys thought of. And uh, just do a little, yeah. Experiment. Try and see if you can figure out what type of error is going to cause things to crash in which direction and whether they're caught or not. All right, so I'm going to push Control C and kill this and then move on. But there's a problem here. Check this out. If I push Control C, it's not actually accepting that keyboard interrupt, it's catching it as user input and recognizing that it's not the right format and it's asking me to. Uh, try again. That's um, the exact reason. Here, let me just. That's the exact reason I put this in a loop that only goes through 10 times because I knew this would happen. And I don't want to have to like completely close idle and open it back up again. Uh, so that's why this was a loop instead of a while true statement to give me that infinite loop um, that I would just, you know, kill with Control C because that would fail an infinite number of times then. So my try except block right here, this one, is a little aggressive. It's, it's catching too many things. I don't want it to catch the keyboard interrupt. I want that one to go through and actually crash the code so I can get out of it. Um, so we're about to, to go learn a little bit more about this try except, how to be a little more specific so we can tell it which kinds of things we want to go through. All right, that's coming up soon. Let me see. All right, first up. Um, how do we, can we get just a little bit more information about the exception when it happens? What if we want to know the reason? Okay, uh, here's the version we just had. Uh, flaky function, print error, or uh, whatever else we're going to do. In this case, um, to upgrade this a little bit, wow, the arrow missed. All right, but it's supposed to be pointed right here at E. Um, here's what we're doing. Instead of just writing accept with a colon, we're going to say exception as E. So this is going to get an exception object, and that exception object describes the problem. It's going to tell us what kind of error or what kind of exception happened. And we can print that out because this exception object E can be turned into a string that we can print. Okay, just want to point out that there are lots of different types of exception objects. This is the most general. It catches pretty much all of them um, and can be... Uh, uh, exception, exceptions of lots of different kinds can be assigned to this. If we want to be a little more specific, that's coming up in a few minutes. But right now, just note that this is going to catch pretty much everything. This exception object is going to describe the problem, and here we'll just print that out. Let's go back to the pizza code and add this. Right here. Perfect. Okay, so right here, uh, I just need to add exception as, and then I just need to give it the name of a variable. This is my choice. I'm just going to shortcut that E. This one is the type of thing I'm catching. So here, like if I wanted to create a list, I would actually use the word list. I'm creating an exception. So this is the what I'm creating. So um, please try again. Let's go ahead and print out the type of the exception. So error, and then we'll call that string E. And then we'll also print out type of error. And uh, just have a go with that. All right, I'm going to add these two lines down here to my other one also. 
places like that. And then I also want to upgrade this so that it's printing out everything all the time for any kind of exception. Okay, I'm gonna uh, save this, we'll run it again. All right, and now let me think, what were some of the kinds of errors? We had the wrong kind of data. I think this was a type error, let's find out. Value error, oh. All right, yeah, so it's could not convert string to float. That's a value error. Okay, um, enter pizza diameter, so we're, we get to try again. Let's see here, hmm. Let's do minus three and six slices. Okay, now this is an analysis error, the error message. Um, okay, I just paused and stared at this for a second because I could not figure out why there was no message there. Um, it's because we didn't upgrade our own assertion. This is an assertion error from our math section, and we didn't actually give it a, an error message yet. So that's coming up soon. Um, this one, when I had the error message, the could not convert string to float was the error message. It's a type value error. This one is a type assertion error, um, and that's our own fault because uh, that's the one I added with the assert statement. Okay, that was just me being, I don't know, I don't even know if you guys knew it, but I was being dumb there and stared at this for a long time trying to think, why did they not print a message? We didn't add that yet. It's coming soon. All right, uh, what were some of the other things we could do? Um, the wrong number of items. That was a, let's see, list index out of range is the message. It is an index error. Okay, so I, I feel like this is good. We're getting the idea that uh, it's now giving us additional information, um, but it's still going to have that problem where I can't, oh, it did fix that. Hold on, why did that work? That's right, okay. So at the end of the lecture, I'm going to show you the hierarchy of all the different kinds of exceptions. Um, let me go to the code here. This one, exception, is a lower level in the hierarchy than that keyboard interrupt exception. So the keyboard interrupt is going to go through. It's, this is no longer going to catch everything above it in the hierarchy. So this actually fixed our keyboard interrupt control C to kill problem. Uh, I thought I had to do something a little more specific. I, I thought exception was one of the like highest levels. I, I can't remember it. It's a chart. I look it up every time I need one of these. So I think that's a good example, some motivation as to why it's actually good to be specific about the kinds of things we want to catch. Exception, this this kind, is very general. If we want to upgrade that to, you know, only catch certain kinds of errors, hold on, let me pull up the slide. But if we only want to catch certain kind of errors, instead of just doing exception as E, like I've got right there, I can actually give it a little tuple uh, of different types of exceptions that I would like to catch. So I can say value error, index error. It's only going to catch those two things now. Um, and this is good because those are the ones that I am prepared to deal with. And I'm going to let the user try again if they make those mistakes. Any other mistake that comes through, we actually want the code to crash. Uh, you know, if I have a mistake like in my own code, if I misname a variable or something, if that's the reason it's crashing, I don't want to give the user the opportunity to try over and over and over again when I made a mistake and have the you know name of one of my variables wrong. Let's go ahead and uh, demonstrate this. Let me pop back over. And I'm going to go ahead and just add a mistake um, right there. So now args got upgraded a little bit. It's got some extra letters. Now if I save this and run this code, um, and put in some bad data. It's giving me an error, uh, local variable args unreferenced or referenced before assignment. This is clearly a problem with my code, but it's gonna say, okay, uh, why don't you try again? Um, I don't want that kind of error to be caught. I don't want errors in my code to be caught. I want errors in user data input to be caught. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this back before I forget. And now what we want to do is learn how to be a little more specific. So here I'm going to be adding the tuple value error and index error um, to, to the code. So that it's only catching those kinds of things where we want to give the user the power to try again. Yep, and um, we do not want to catch name error or other like bugs in my code. And not the keyboard interrupt, we want to be able to quit. And please remember, um, 
I, a good a good guideline is to just to be as specific as possible to catch the ones that you're prepared to deal with and let everything else crash um, and always print something out so the user knows there was a problem uh, basically if we put a try accept and then don't print out anything it's actually hiding potentially really bad things all right let me go ahead and do that to the pizza code all right so right here instead of exception as e I'm gonna go ahead and put in a tuple so I've got the parentheses and then the two types that we are prepared to deal with here are index error when they put in the wrong number of arguments and value error when um, that was the one where if they type in something that could not be converted to a float or an int all right so let's go ahead um, let's just test this much so I'm gonna save and run this restarting slice count so now if we put in um, the wrong type of data it's still gonna catch that it's catching value errors and if I put in um, the wrong number of items now it's catching that index error so this looks good to me we're catching very specific things um, I fixed the typo in my code but let me go ahead and put that back in and demonstrate how do I get back there right here let's go ahead and put this back in save this run it and now if I type in 44 uh, what I find is that it's gonna actually really crash and give me a real error message about the bug in my code which is good I want to be able to see it crash and go fix that right like this done all right so I keep I kept hinting at this exception hierarchy there's about 40 different kinds of exceptions on this chart right here um, you can see that some of them like all right, actually it's probably really tiny so just trust me if you can't read it that this one right up here at the near the very top is the exception that's a very general one that catches all of these different kinds of errors um, when we do when we didn't do anything when we just said accept without you know accept colon that catches absolutely everything and so that one catches the keyboard interrupt which is actually number two here on the list right after system exit um, the exception uh, we used the exception as e is below that so that was not catching the keyboard interrupt so it's it's almost always a good idea to be as specific as possible so the ones we were using let me see if I can spot them index error right here for looking things up in general there's like a, a one level up is the lookup error which will catch both like index from a list and key errors from a dictionary um, so we want to be as specific as possible when we use these so that we're not catching things that we are not prepared to deal with all right um, all right, so next up, what if we want to produce a specific kind of error? So there was a assertion was was great for just like crashing the code. That's great for while we're going through developing things. If there's a mistake, we can spot it. Or if we run into something where we are like 99% sure that this will never happen, we can just put in an assert so that it will crash should that ever happen. And then we can deal with it. Otherwise, you know, if we're pretty sure we don't ever have to deal with this corner case, we can uh, leave that part of the development till later and wait till the customers complain and then we can go ahead and fix it but if it only affects you know one percent of the customers do we really want to invest a lot of development time right now or when we can just put in one line crash the code and then come back later but frequently it could be really useful to um, put in a specific kind of error uh, not just the generic assert so that's what i want to do now uh, but a moment ago when i was talking about how well, wow, where's that error message? I, why is it not printing? That's because the cert is very, very simple. It's not gonna, it just crashes. It's not gonna actually give me that extra information. So in order to do that, um, instead of just calling an assertion error, uh, it would be more useful to get a more specific type of error. So to, to generate any of the rest of these, to basically have our code generate an error, um, the way we're gonna do that is using the command raise. So there's a lot going on here. Um, version one, this is the one we had just quick and dirty using assert. So here's the pizza slice size uh, function, uh, just a small piece of it. If radius was greater than or equal to zero, uh, then we're, we're good, we're gonna continue on. So uh, the, in this version, we're gonna say 
Okay, so if this is true, it continues. What we want to know is if it's bad, so if radius is less than or equal to zero, then we're going to um, have Python um, create this exception object. And the way we do that here is keyword raise tells this is where the tells Python this is where the exception happens. This arithmetic error is the type of the error. So we are creating uh, an arithmetic error object. So this is a constructor. Just like when we had list with parentheses, um, this is the same thing. I'm creating an object using uh, parentheses. Dict with parentheses, set with parentheses. Uh, all of those things created lists or dictionaries or sets. This one just happens to be creating uh, the type error. Um, and then we can give it a specific message. So this is going to overwrite the just generic arithmetic error message with our specific arithmetic error message for this particular um, problem. So let me jump back over to the pizza code and just add this right here. Uh, that's the wrong button. There we go. Okay. All right. So let's see here. Where was the assertion? Here we go. Assert radius greater than zero. Instead, what I'm going to do is change this to if radius less than or equal to zero. So now I've got a conditional here. What I want to do is raise the arithmetic error and just give it a, a useful um, message. You need a positive number of slices. <clears throat> All right, uh, I think this is the only one I'm going to put in. So let's just go ahead and, and run this and try it out. Let's see here. Save, run. Now here we go. At the bottom, we have a 10 inch pizza and zero slices. I need a comma. That should go ahead, give us that analysis error. Hmm, wait a second. It's still reporting assertion error. What did I do wrong? Oh, that was dumb. Okay, so here's, here's the problem. What I really wanted is this slice count less than or equal to zero, then report the number of slices must be positive. So I had radius there instead. Let me go ahead and put this one as radius, just so we catch everything. Uh, even if it's uh, an assertion error instead of this cool arithmetic error. All right. And, you know, I just I went back and looked at the slides to see, like, am I using this wrong? And I made the same mistake in the slides. Okay. Uh, save this. Run it. Let's try this again. 10-inch diameter pizza. Zero slices. There we go. Beautiful. All right. It's great to end on a positive note. Error message is now working. Number of slices must be positive. And it's now throwing the arithmetic error. All right, exactly what I want. So very restrictive. Um, it's only going to catch that. Or wait, it's uh, it's generating the exact kind of error that it's actually that I want to produce, not the generic sort of um, assertion error. And then we can we know that this is uh, you know later in the code we can we can look specifically for arithmetic errors and deal with them. All right, so today we learned about how to make our code crash more and how to make our code crash less. So to make it crash more, we were using assertions to force a crash or um, to raise an exception when something bad happened. Uh, and this is going to give us a, a way to catch semantic errors and turn them into runtime errors so that it crashes um, and we can actually like learn what went wrong rather than just being given a mysterious, maybe correct answer that is actually not correct. And then we learned how to crash less by dealing with the exceptions that are created when code crashes. We learned how to produce them with rays. We learned how to give them useful messages. We learned how to use try and accept clauses to um, test our code. If any of that code raised an exception or would have crashed, we can then deal with it. And we can selectively deal with certain kinds of problems. You know, if we know that the uh, the user input is responsible for certain kinds of things, we can check that. If we're other kinds of errors, we want to make sure the code still crashes. So we can uh, look for specific types of errors and deal with them. Um, so in general, make our exception checking as specific as possible and make sure you always print something out. All right, that way we don't like mask 
like hide extra errors. All right, that's going to do it for me, guys. This is the last slide. Uh, have a great day, and talk to you soon.